stupid announcement about uh, something else vaguely unrelated. If you guys happen to be coming to, and I'm guessing that probably most of you won't, these are going to be two different audiences, but if you know anybody who wants to come to the um, Think Like a Hacker workshop that we're doing right after this on the sixth floor, it's going to run half an hour extra. Um, they sort of botched our time bobbling, so uh, that's going to be there. Uh, but do, if you know of any noobs to the space, my partner Sarah and I, who's right up here in the front row, are going to be working on that. Uh, see you in a few there, but I will get started here momentarily. day two of the Circle of Hope is Saturday. Hope everyone had a fantastic evening. And today, Saturday, is a fantastic day. We are jammed end to end with content. You're here for a fantastic talk. That'll begin momentarily. There's a lot of other stuff going on throughout the day. As you know, there's three speaker sessions here next door and in the lower uh, lobby area. The Ritchie Room is down. We're in Booth. Vaughn is over there. There's a fourth track, a fourth unscheduled track, which now is being scheduled. And we have a bunch of stuff starting up. I think, I um, don't know if there's something at noon, but there's an Alcor talk at 1 p.m. There is a knapsack talk at 2 p.m. A lot of other great stuff happening up the hallway here in the Nez Room, which is a fourth unscheduled track. And there were a couple of other spots that you could sign up for as well. I think a lot of people will be excited about the uh, Chelsea Manning interview, and that's going to be simulcast to all three rooms. So you can be here, you can be the lower level, you can be in the next room, and you'll see, see what's going on up on the screen. So that's going to be, I think, an um, interesting talk, and also uh, they'll be taking a variety of audience questions, I understand. Uh, we like to remind people that if you are not on call, not expecting a call from your lawyer, not expecting a call from the maternity ward, now is a good time to put your cell phone on vibrate or mute so that you don't disturb the people next to you too much. We also like to remind people to please um, remove your trash. Last thing I'll mention, uh, I just said that we are going to have uh, streaming of the Manning interview in a couple of hours among the different rooms. And streaming is provided by ISOC, and we thank ISOC for doing that. They're running the cameras, they're running the distribution network, they're also doing the um, uh, broadcast the live streams that you might have seen on the hope.net website and uh, thanks to ISOC for doing that. You can also visit ISOC down on the mezzanine level and uh, I saw a sign there before that you can join for 10 bucks and get a t-shirt and I don't know if you've shopped around in New York but 10 bucks is a pretty good pretty good price for a t-shirt. So, um, so that's something to, uh, to consider. So thanks again for being here and we're going to uh, go ahead. We have um, uh, Gus Andrews talking about the problem and maybe the solution, but certainly the problem with the hacker mystique. Can I get this? I'd like to get my this the last mile problem here. I'm sorry. I was like, I'd like to have this up on the stage because I kind of want to stand today. Is this a thing? 
I can, I can stand here. That's fine. I was going to Well, I mean, it's this is—is is this yours? No, I have no idea. What what? This is. Well, this we can move this. Left water bottle here. What is no, this? this is like lost and found going on what on the podium. What is this lost and found podium? Yeah. yeah. Uh, the main thing is this has some sort of massive anchor. Yeah. It's possibly a kraken attached. Uh, I think we're to... Yep. There we go. Yeah. There's actually. We can separate... solve this problem. Hold on a moment, but there's a separate. Yeah, there is. That's what I was oh, saying. Oh, there's HDMI on the lectern. It's hard, okay. to see. hard to see with the uh, lights. There we go. Oh, I see it. it. I see it. I see it. There we, we go. Uh, yeah, let's maybe unplug it see. this way and then plug it in that way so it knows what it's doing. Yes. Fantastic. Hi, everybody. Oh, I'm shorter than Greg. That usually happens. <clears throat> and then we have this again. Sorry, guys. One second. I'm going to give you a brief content warning while I'm trying to uh, get this set up. Um, brief and respectful reference is going to be made to Aaron Swartz. Um, abusers in the digital security space will also be mentioned, and uh, abusers' behaviors will be discussed in the abstract. Um, where possible, I'm going to try to mitigate this with cats, as we do, in our, as is the way of our people. <clears throat> Good morning. Um, Thanks for coming to your biennial uh, Dr. Gus homily on human complications and meat body stuff. Um, thank you. I know I have some regulars here. Um, my theme today is how did we get here? <clears throat> so what do I mean by the hacker mystique? Title of my talk is the problem with the hacker mystique. What do I mean by that? I'm going to use pop culture to illustrate with the caveat that, yes, I know hackers are not exactly what the media think we are, but the media do foreground some of the th same things that drew us to hacking. For example, in this episode of the kids' show Ghost Rider, uh, there are some themes which I think are worth teasing out as we try to reckon with, oh, man, I, I am going to need audio on this. Do we have audio? Are we cool? On the lectern. Sweet. Uh, yeah, it's on, it's on the lectern. It should be. I'm in the HDI. Am I on the lectern? Okay. Um, oh, eighth inch? Okay, sorry. More things. There we go. There's one of those. It plugs in here. This is actually moving, moving quite smoothly. There we go. Um, sorry about that. Forgot what I needed. Um, so if in this episode of the kids' show Ghostwriter, there's a couple of themes which I think are worth uh, teasing out as we try to reckon with what it means to be a hacker, which parts we value, and which parts we maybe want to rethink. So here's the clip. Do you know anything about hackers? Can you jam with the console cowboys in cyberspace? What? Ever read Neuromancer? Huh? Ever experienced the new wave? Next wave? Dream wave? Or cyberpunk? I didn't think so. I'll handle the hacker stories. Yeah, I guess you should. We should learn about all this hacker stuff. In there. It's a world where you're judged by what you say and think, not by what you look like. A world where curiosity and imagination equals power. We need more paper. Let's go, people. Work with me here. Work with me. Computer, you're the only one who understands me. <clears throat> All right, so the writer of this episode probably came from outside the hacker community, I'm guessing, but he knew enough to reflect this back, reflect it back to us like this. Hacking is appealing because it calls us back to a world where skill matters. And all the imitations of our looks, our bodies, and our social skills fall away. That same appeal is referred to in this still from the movie Hackers. If you will please move to my next slide. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> so if you take a look over on the uh, right here, um, that sign that they've pasted up on the uh, right, uh, always yield to the hands-on on imperative, is um, an observation Stephen Levy made in his study of hackers. Uh, and the earliest computer hackers at MIT. Um, those hackers believed the best way to learn was to get hands on, to take things apart, and to see how they work. Levy distilled another lesson from the earliest hackers this way. Hackers should be judged by their hacking, not by bogus criteria such as degrees, age, race, or position. That was the ethos of the earliest hackers at MIT. The mainstream of the internet is about image and appearance today. Everyone has a profile photo, if not whole Instagram feeds or YouTube channels. Social norms have invaded the internet in a way that the builders of the internet never really intended to happen. But hacking, unlike, unlike mainstream internet use, hacking is still ostensibly about skill, right? And about learning about the power of technology itself. It's about escaping from boundaries and norms. This is why a lot of us are here. 
Some of us were not much older than the kids on Ghost Rider when we got involved with Hope uh, or in hacking. I just want to note we have a apparently 12-year-old Mac Blaze in the center there. Uh, future lawyer Alex Urbelis in the upper uh, right there. Um, Jason Scott, before he grew a hat. Um, and uh, Lady Ada apparently started in the scene very, very early there. Um, many other people much younger. Um, <clears throat> so we were not much older than those kids when we got involved in Hope or Hacking. We were attracted by the freedom that hacking offered us or by the thrill of getting away with crossing boundaries. A lot of us are older now. Um, I believe all of us who were here are older now. Uh, the question is whether we stayed, right? For some of us, hacking is now work. Uh, leaving us with a quandary, do we still call you by your handle at work? Do we call you Mr. The Plague? Uh, for others of us, hacking in this conference are still all play or activism. As our roles change, what are our goals for being at this conference? Are they different from newcomers' goals for the conference? What do we owe each other, newcomers and old heads? I want to call your attention to something else from that ghostwriter clip. Miss New Wave, Next Wave, Dream Wave there was throwing around jargon. She wasn't sharing information about the supposedly cool things that she was into. She was intimidating by showing off thing, other things that the other kid didn't know. The scriptwriter knew that hackers had a bunch of privileged information and he saw the romance in that. There's a just out of reach allure to it. He also knew some hackers aren't above making people feel excluded or less than because they're not down with the knowledge. I want us to think about a couple of themes in pop culture representations of hacking and in our own hacking communities. Hacking is sexy. Hacking is thrilling because it breaks boundaries. Hackers find and exploit vulnerabilities. We pick locks. Whether we're white hat or black hat, we demonstrate the limits of the law and the limits of safety. And that makes for actual physical arousal, fear or excitement, as well as an edgy image that has drawn many of us to hacking. Hacking is secretive. Hacking's domain is secret protected information. In some cases, the information is private or an elect group of people are supposed to have access to it. Um, they're the only ones who are supposed to have access to the information that as people working in information security, we seek or protect. <clears throat> in other cases, like cryptography, very few people understand the subject matter. And the end result is a small number of people who have power that others do not. And this is a problem. Whether we hack for play or work, I'm going to argue that we need to give up the sexiness of hacking and the mystique of secrecy in order to survive as a community. <clears throat> That sexiness and secretiveness can be exploited for abuse, both by bad actors among us and by nefarious external political and government forces. The more we play up secrecy, boundary-breaking thrills, and the power dynamics those entail, the more likely our communities are to be taken down by our own flaws and by those who would exploit them. Instead, we need to return to valuing the actual work that individual hackers do. <coughs> Pardon me. <coughs> In No More Rock Stars, a thoughtful piece they wrote a few years back, Lee Honeywell, Mary Gardner, and Valerie Aurora made a similar plea. They led with this quote. Rock stars are arrogant narcissists. Plumbers keep us all from getting cholera. Build functional, functional infrastructure. Be a plumber. <clears throat> they noted that abusers in tech often excuse their boundary violations as individual eccentricity or as part of a utopian vision for societal change or in some cases genius, another term that we need to stop throwing around because among other things, Steve Jobs was notoriously abusive to those around him, for example. Often our community accepts these excuses and lets them slide. I want to exhort everyone here personally to resist efforts to treat any member of our community as a celebrity. We need to stop with the cult of tech genius. We need to build more networks of trust involving working people, not networks of hype surrounding celebrities. Let's delve into this deeper. I mentioned that hacking breaks boundaries, and what do I mean by that? <clears throat> so here's an example. Uh, it was recently proposed that there would be voter registration at DEF CON, prompting consternation from many of us. One friend of mine summed up her frustration with this proposal beautifully. The reason hackers are so notoriously, no notoriously bad at consent is because they regard violating boundaries as an implicit social good. <clears throat> This is something each hacker needs to ask him themselves. Do I think that violating social boundaries is inherently good? All boundaries? All the time? 
If we set violating any and all boundaries as true north on our compasses, can we ever draw back and say, no, this boundary, this one boundary, must not be violated? We have language for thinking about this and hacking already, white hat and black hat. White hat hackers are understood to hack for good, to be ethical in which boundaries they choose to violate. Black hat hackers are seen as having no ethics, willing to break into systems for personal gain or work for the highest bidder. So like I said, I think each of us needs to take time, think hard and be explicit with ourselves. Why are we violating a boundary? And what are we accomplishing by, by violating it? Let's break down what happens when a boundary is violated. Sometimes it is calling society into question. Sometimes it's tied to secrecy and power. Sometimes it's related to marginalization. And sometimes it's potentially putting those involved in legal jeopardy. And frequently, it's exciting. So what do I mean? <clears throat> By calling society into question, much of the well-known work of 2600 Magazine and free software efforts have pushed the boundaries of copyright law under the belief that knowing how things work empowers everyday citizens who would otherwise be ruled by corporations whose interest is profit, not human growth and understanding. Queer communities also push the boundaries of gender and sexuality so that we can all live safely and comfortably with ourselves the way we were born and, with, and love who we love. How are boundaries tied to secrecy and power? Boundaries can keep people away from information, privileging those who have access to it. Secrecy has been one of the themes of hacking. We work with tools like encryption, which protects secrecy, and tools like WikiLeaks, which shatter it. Secrecy can make it so that security experts have power, which others lack. Boundaries can marginalize or be a tool of the marginalized. Boundaries and centers of power define marginalization. Those who are already on the margins of society may ignore boundaries because they have nothing to gain by staying within them. Again, queer communities have had less investment in maintaining existing boundaries about self-representation and sexuality. There are also now boundaries in place like code of conduct policies, which are there to declare that we don't want people to be marginalized based on who they are. Boundaries potentially put those involved in legal jeopardy. If the boundary in question is legal, it's about copyright or election protection or about uh, laws about financial fraud, the people violating the boundaries may risk being jailed. This overlaps with other aspects I've mentioned. Copyright violation may call society into question but still carry legal risk. Same with leaking secrets. And boundaries are exciting. Violating boundaries and taboos on a very basic physical level raises our adrenaline level. Uh, it makes our entire system excited or aroused. We're aware of the risk that we may be caught crossing a boundary and may be punished for it. Much as we might want to be cyborgs, we're actually chemborgs. Our physical and neurological chemistry colors everything we do. So excitement and adrenaline raise the stakes of all these other aspects of boundary violation. <clears throat> With the exception of legal jeopardy, these are generally the upsides of boundary violation. It's exciting, it's powerful, it helps us change society. But even the upsides are sometimes abused. The work we do is most dangerous when it attracts people who are inclined to abuse power, trust, to abuse those who are marginalized, sex and sexiness. In the past few years, we have learned over and over that hacking and tech have attracted just such abusers. Here in the hacker community, Captain Crunch, Jacob Applebaum, who keynoted here at Hope, Julian Assange, Morgan Marquis Bois. In the Pearl community, Michael Schwern, in the tech freedom community, Ali Bangi. They use their knowledge of technology to gain advantage over others and wield personal power over them. Let me go into what their abuse and others' abuse of boundaries looks like. <clears throat> we have sort of a circular problem when it comes to secrecy and trust in the hacker community. Our work or our play is both about secrecy and requires secrecy of us. We build tools for secrecy and trust and explain how they work. We provide secrecy for others, and we often need to trust experts in this space to tell us who and what to trust. Some information about hacking-related technology isn't secret, it's just really hard for everyday people to understand. Take cryptography. There's a very limited number of experts out there who can judge how likely it is that a cryptographic scheme is vulnerable, or explain this graph to you, for that matter. Beyond that small circle, there's also a limited number of people with the security expertise to understand if crypto protocols have been deployed well. Most of us have few grounds for evaluating the security claims they make. When I say most of us, I maybe mean less people in the hacker space, but the rest of the world. 
In the few years after the Snowden leaks, I saw the limited sharing of expertise and the limited definition of expertise result in people being less secure. At the Open Internet Tools Project, we introduced secure communications tools to journalists and activists abroad. We use Signal, Tor, and the GPG Tools Suite, among others. And we often failed to convince these journalists and activists to adopt, adopt these tools. These journalists and activists were novices in tech, but they were experts in living their own lives under extreme duress. They were being jailed in Vietnam and Ethiopia for the crime of blogging about the government, sometimes on computers they shared with their whole families, often running decades-old windows. They were covering the war in Syria, and their pages were being shut down by Facebook for showing gore, because there was murder on the streets of Syria. When free software militants insisted the journalists wipe their shared family computers and install secure Linux variants, the activists and journalists knew this wasn't an option for them, and they kept using their bootlegs. When privacy and security fanatics exhorted them to delete their Facebook accounts, they threw out that advice, because that's where they were storing the documentation of war crimes, and they knew how large their audience was. Nothing but Facebook could give them that. The developers making the software, by contrast, took a long time to both learn and value these users' expertise. <clears throat> they kept insisting, we can't simplify this idea about public keys, or mobiles are hopelessly insecure. And the result was software so complicated and foreign to users that they abandoned it, or they used it wrong and their security was back to square one. Part of our problem here is what they call contempt culture. Hackers may think that we're liberated from social boundaries, but when it comes to your operating system or the programming language you use, I bet your social currency with your friends involves, what, displays of contempt for Windows users, Windows losers? Harsh words for people who believe they're writing secure JavaScript? We don't even think about how our culture is based on demonstrating we're smarter than others. A few Python developers have pointed out that language shaming of PHP tends to be directed at people who come to programming through the non-traditional path of working on WordPress or Drupal installations, a group which is disproportionately female. Language shaming may have knock-on effects on who feels comfortable showing up in our spaces, and it's worth making efforts to counter this. You may not have noticed, but Hope's Code of Conduct specifically welcomes everyone, regardless of text editor choice, to avoid this. Mr. Stallman. <laughs> a harm reduction approach would have been more effective for the activists we were working with, or software that was based on their knowledge of what their situation on the ground was and not contemptuous of their operating system choices that they made for financial reasons. Fortunately, uh, the community working on these tools has moved in that direction since then. They are doing a lot more to understand the situation on the ground, but prioritizing developers' expertise over that of the people using the software puts the lives at risk. Limited expertise is most dangerous when newcomers to the community hang on securities, sorry, on celebrities and experts, believing that those celebrities and experts have access to knowledge the rest of us can't possibly fathom. When we act like security is unknowably hard and only to be handled by insiders, we prepare the groundwork, each of us, for newcomers to be groomed and preyed upon by charlatans and abusers. We build missing stairs. We were reminded of our dependence on experts when it became clear that it was dangerous to have let Jake, Morgan, and Ali into our spaces because they were physically and sexu sexually abusing people. Some may have felt it wasn't worth giving up these men's expertise and felt inclined to protect them. In this way, centralized expertise becomes a community vulnerability. When we act like security is just an, uh, an expert domain, we encouraged learned helplessness. How do I shoe? I don't know how to shoe. I can't use this technology. When we emphasize the boundary between our expertise and lay people's ignorance, we may think that we're teaching them how to, th to think like hackers, but we're not. Hacking was never about encouraging people to defer to authority. We need to not shame people for where they're starting from, technically. We need to give people the tools and the leeway to push back on the boundaries we have set around our own expertise. <clears throat> so, more on boundaries and marginalization. Here's how people get marginalized. Many of us in the hacker community are, in one way or another, already marginalized. We already have an outsider's relationship with social boundaries. Just appearing to be a hacker can put you on the wrong side of legal boundaries, as many of us have experienced. Plenty of us are not neurotypical. We fall on the autism or ADD spectrums. Some of us are also queer or part of a kink scene, not to mention those of us who just feel we never fit in anywhere, but we fit in here and we're hungry for community. 
Unfortunately, there are boundaries in our communities which are sometimes at cross purposes with each other when it comes to empowering or marginalizing people. We will want to think hard about which boundaries of this sort we want to violate, how, and why. Codes of conduct at conferences, unfortunately, are at this collision of boundaries. Some people want a boundary that keeps sexualized content out of unrelated talks. They want to be able to get through their day, I want to be able to get through my day, without, the stress levels, without our stress levels going through the roof when, out of nowhere, someone suggests women's only reason for being at a conference, or otherwise, is to attract male sexual attention, or that sexual violence is a fair target for jokes. For some people, this may actually trigger post-traumatic stress. Sex-positive activists, meanwhile, may be uncomfortable with a boundary that blanket excludes sexual content. They see that boundary as suggesting that sex is a stigmatized, unacceptable public topic. Women, people of color, queer folks, and folks with disabilities may similarly want a boundary which asks community members to refrain from making derogatory comments about them, similarly to avoid the stress that comes from constantly second-guessing whether people around you secretly think you don't belong here and want you to leave. Free speech activists may see that, want to see that boundary erased. They see completely free speech as an unmitigated good. Generally, they see it as the underpinning of a free society and setting any boundaries as the beginning of a slippery slope to authoritarianism. These are very hard boundaries to walk when you're trying to organize a conference that welcomes a range of people. Seriously, this is not a fight that any of us picks for fun. It is never any fun. I've been there. It's just always a veil of tears. Comedy writers have terms that can help us, each of us, think about whether we want to make Sorry, whether we're making boundary violations we ethically believe in. They talk about punching up or punching down. You may be familiar with these terms. When a comic tells a joke about people in power, say someone in government or the head of a corporation, that's punching up. When a comic sticks to jokes about people who are still legitimately the targets of physical, legal, and economic threats, Black Lives Matter, trans folks, and generally people who are targets for just being who they are, that's punching down. Punching up takes a poke at per perpetrators. Punching down strikes those who have, already, who have already been struck, the victims. One comic talking about how punching down often makes for crappy comedy had this take on free speech. Sure, you have a right to say whatever you want about anyone, but you don't have a right to a platform. The rest of us are not obligated to give you a platform. Sorry, go stand on your own soapbox. Each of us should ask ourselves this. If the boundary being violated might take individual hackers out of the conversation, through personal stress, social exclusion, or even violence, is that a boundary that I really value violating? If so, what is it that I value about that? Is the boundary in question one that is related to something that people can't change about themselves? Their sexuality, their body, their personal history? Do I value allowing others to violate that boundary around me? Or do we not care about causing others stress? Do we say, suck it up, kid, life is stressful, hacking is war? Is it really effective to act like that? Do we make hacker conferences a high-stress environment to continue to drive home to everyone how life and death, how cloak and dagger our work is? Again, that doesn't work. It's more likely to get people to act helpless. Now we're back to the sexy mystique of hacking. Honestly, what does it get us? As individuals, a certain power. As a community, honestly, I just think a lot of drama, heat and noise. Heat and noise come from an inefficient system. So how do we stick to healthy boundary violation and identify when a hacker's boundary violation is becoming abusive? <clears throat> I've talked about the bright side where boundary pushing hacking has helped us envision new ways of being ourselves and being a society. I think the danger of abuse arises when individual hackers ignore the distinction between individual or societal boundary pushing and interpersonal boundary pushing. In other words, violating consent. And this touches on some of the marginalization, but also on my earlier points about legal jeopardy and excitement. I don't think we need to think about copyright violation or someone biohacking themselves, for example, as indicators of abusiveness. I don't think that's as much of a problem. Copyright violation is punching up. Personal biohacking is somebody's own business. Pushing one-on-one -on -one or small group interpersonal boundaries is a more worrying sign. We all need to know what grooming looks like. Not actually this kind of grooming, but it might involve smaller people. And not just because hacking has long been an all-ages pursuit, and there are young people among us. Those engaged in domestic abuse also engage in grooming. So do scammers, and so do others who engage in senior abuse. But one of the rock star abusers in our space had a history of forcing people to eat things. 
When reports came out that he had raped people, this stuck out more as a sign of his trying to overpower people around him. Another abuser violated interpersonal boundaries with constant requests that young men give him massages and do exercises which put them in unwanted physical contact with him. Abusers often target victims who are socially marginalized, already on the outside of boundaries, like I said, many of us hackers, and people who are relatively powerless. This may make the victims more e eager for positive attention and less willing to speak out against their abusers. The person doing the grooming makes their victim feel special, giving the victim a positive feeling and a bond they don't want to give up. Abusers may invite victims to violate social boundaries with them. The adrenaline thrill this produces can be attractive. The results can make the victim feel the abuser is the only one they can talk to, as they may be ashamed or obliged to keep illegal behavior a secret. <clears throat> Abusers alternate between supportive and harmful behaviors, gradually violating more and more boundaries. This overcomes resistance and normalizes their harmful behavior. The authors of No More Rockstars thus recommend watching for small signs of boundary pushing as abusers will often try to push boundaries in order to see what they can get away with, letting others excuse it as their eccentricity. They note that rock stars feel entitled to other people's time, work, and bodies, and this may be an indicator that they feel entitled to other things, like credit for work that others did, or an organization's finances. No More Rockstars recommends concrete steps to avoid this kind of abuse. They recommend not setting up situations which make it more likely that interpersonal boundaries will be violated. These include code of conduct topics I mentioned earlier, taking sex off the table as a topic, or at least taking it off the table in talks that aren't headlined as about sex. Um, that takes away abuser's cover. Individually, talking about sex or fantasies with, in otherwise non-sexual settings is one way that victims are made to feel sexual contact with the abuser is normal. This is part of what I mean when I say we need to step away from the sexiness of hacking. <clears throat> Setting a code of conduct that asks people to be respectful in how they talk about race, sexual orientation, and gender can also make it clearer when somebody transgresses these boundaries. The authors of No More Rockstars recommend establishing rules about romantic relationships between organizers of events or leaders of organizations. Setting these boundaries can leave less room for someone abusive to bully others and pass it off as normal or reasonable. If we establish boundaries around alcohol or drug use, there are fewer opportunities for an abuser to take advantage of someone who's incapacitated, or worse, as has happened in some cases in our community, for someone to drug people's drinks without being detected. There are also steps to take against abusers who manipulate the power and knowledge of hacking. <clears throat> we can call people out for monopolizing attention and credit. There's the one that I'm sitting in, and there's all the other ones that I'm touching and not actually occupying, right? If someone spends time making themselves look big rather than furthering the work that needs to be done, call them out. If they're monopolizing conversation, call them out, even if they're the hotshot everyone else is referring to. For example, one abuser was known for what people laughingly called story time with him, once taking up 45 minutes of airtime in a series of five minute lightning talks. I don't even know how that happens, but. If someone is stepping up to be the spokesman at every public opportunity, find a way to support other people in becoming a spokesman. Suggest someone else speak to the journalist or give the talk at that conference. The press also needs to help us on this. If you're a journalist, stop building hacker profiles on the mystique. For that matter, stop basing profiles on individuals. Ask to speak with a number of people doing concrete work. Cookie licking is another problematic rock star behavior, meaning doing what some kids do to own all the treats, licking every cookie on the plate and putting it back. It's mine now. When someone volunteers to do a lot of work on a project, then fails to do it, or refuses to make their work available to others on the project, that's essentially cookie licking. I once, wa once watched Jake uh, extract a tracker that he claimed had been placed on the car of an activist who had already been exploited in an abusive relationship. She had been dating an undercover cop. Jake then insisted on analyzing the tracker himself, and that frustrated the organizers of the event where this happened, who needed to be able to protect everybody else, the hundreds of other activists in, attention, uh, sorry, in attendance from police surveillance. Again, call this kind of cookie licking out and have plans to distribute work more evenly. <clears throat> to keep abusive rock stars from monopolizing power, build a deep bench of talent. Flatten organizational hierarchy. Make hierarchy and the responsibility of roles explicit too, because nobody's in charge here, man, we're all equals, is usually a lie. This is what they call the tyranny of structurelessness. 
de facto power structures emerge in groups of people. Part of fairness is making clear what the unwritten rules and power structures are. This is how we make sure that individual people don't become central points of failure, whether they're abusers or just people vulnerable to illness or accident. No one person should have the login credentials for a group project's website or GitHub repo. Hope actually nearly lost a website and lost precious time on a cookie-licking web dev a couple years ago. <clears throat> if there's funders that you're working with in your organization, there should be more than one person talking with them. This is also a good way to keep an organization from the founderitis or founder syndrome that Greg Newby gave a talk about uh, some years back. If there's finances involved, there shouldn't just be a backup plan, there should be transparency into where the money is going and coming from. For example, anyone here know about Hope's finances? Just saying. I think it's worth being wary of anyone who wants to take advantage of the cloak and dagger sexiness of hacking. You're clearly hiding here. Be wary of anyone who brags about the secret and privileged knowledge they have. My current peeve is anyone who talks up the revolution, asking you to toast to it, Jake did that to me, welcoming to it, to, uh, you to it. Fuck you, rock stars, seriously. Like, people die in revolutions. This is not sexy, okay? Like, this is not your personal cute joke. When other people around you are romanticizing hacking or making goo-goo eyes over someone who does, point out how unhackerish it is to value people based on their iconic image or alleged skills rather than the work they actually do. So hackers, go forth. Do not conflate sexiness with hacking. Do not confuse contempt and ideological purity with knowledge or belonging, lest you push people out. Think hard about the boundaries you are violating and why do you think it is good to violate them, each one. Rock stars will fail us. Let's distribute knowledge and failure more wildly, widely. Hackers, we can do better. Thank you. Thank you, this is really a joint effort. I have to thank everybody who helped me um, get this talk together. I can't see time, good God, is it really only 11.30? Yeah. Did I go that fast? That was like 50 slides, okay. Um, great, we've got time for talks. Um, do go to the microphone, that's how ISOC knows to stream your question to the world. Um, yeah, I'm seeing a question, go ahead. Hello, I, um, I consider Emmanuel Goldstein a, a rock star. Um, don't you think that certain people that have, you know, more than others contributed uh, to community knowledge, um, you know, just sort of bringing things together, are more deserving than others of being sort of, I, I think, being put on a pedestal of um, just going be up and beyond others, you know, for the co um, contributions. Mm -hmm. um, I, I see where. Um, um, you talked a lot about, you know, room for abuse, and, you know, I completely agree that there is, you know, always, you know, room for abuse from those at the top to people below them, um, but, you know, isn't that the, um, the exception rather than the rule? So, I, one, I think my first question for you, um, so you may want to stay at the mic for a second, is have you worked closely with Emmanuel Goldstein? Um, no, but I'm at his conference for the um, second time, and uh, I think this is a great organization. Is he the only organizer here? Um, he, I, I just used him as one example. No, um, no, but it's, this is a good point. I mean, this is something I want to pick apart because I think this is a mistake we make, right? We believe that Emmanuel is the only guy here. Frankly, um, Greg Newby, who was up here earlier, um, like I've, I've helped run the conference a couple of times. I've stopped because for organizing a conference is really hard and there's some, you know, there's sometimes abuse that goes on behind the scenes. But frankly, um, you know, like Greg Newby barely ever takes credit for the work that he does. Greg does amazing work. Our AV team does like, there would be no conference with the <laughs> Fucking love you guys. My AV team was out until two in the morning and we told them they'd be out by two. They were probably out until three and they were continuing to go. And then Jason, who was out there the whole time, shows up for my talk and he was probably here earlier. I'm like, what the hell, dude, you're amazing. Like, thank you. Yeah, I mean like, this is our problem. This is the thing is we are making rock stars by pretending that there's only one person doing this. Um, you know, and I, I think it's worth getting closer and understanding how the conference actually runs. I mean, 
you know, I don't necessarily always want to suggest this to people because honestly, like running a conference really is, um, you put in more energy than you get back in even recognition or, you know, acknowledgement by people like, hey, you can run a conference. Like it's, there's, it's a kind of a zero sum game, but like get in close and understand what happens. Like, um, you know, and then, and be one of those people yourself. And then you'll get a clearer picture that it's not just one rock star. There's a lot of people involved. I I didn't mean to take away from <coughs> no, it's okay. you know, everyone con you know contributing, but there there is a sort of a uh, pivotal point where um, you know leadership of bringing all the people together. Um, you know, there's a, a best actor award and best supporting actor. I mean, mm, you, you, for, 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 for a come movie on, do we really want to be the Oscars? I mean, come on, we're you know that's not that's not who we are here. Um, no, but uh, th th seriously, and I don't mean to take away from your question. That was actually a really useful and effective question, and I do think, um, I mean, like. Yeah, get familiar with the work that people do. And, and like you said, so there, there is a role for the convener, right, and for the person who brings people together. It's, it's sort of a figurehead role. Like you, everybody comes together to rally around this one person. They rally around Chelsea. Um, they rally around Assange at one point. Um, you know, we've rallied around a whole bunch of people. But that's not always the same as the person who does the work. You know, like that's frequently not the same as the person who does the work or which work the person is doing. Like Emmanuel does run 2600 Magazine. He mostly makes off the hook work, but there's some other people behind the scenes that off the hook too. And, and it's worth looking into these things and sort of seeing what actually goes on. Next question. Yeah, every, I'm pretty sure everybody gets one of these little booklets here with the, uh, the, yeah. the conference talks. Oh, yeah. And when you were mentioning that, um, we should be wary of people who want to, you know, rally you to a cause and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I kind of, you know, I go through this like most people do, and I mm -hmm. try to find things that interest me. And I know that there, there isn't a lot of rallying to a cause, actually, in a lot of these talks. Richard Stallman's still on stage, right? <laughs> is he still, really? <laughs> oh, yeah. No, he is. He's getting two. I mean, like, I think he and that's the thing. They've given thing him two too. hours, and I can tell you what he's going to say is, don't say open source software, because he's showed up at my talk just to tell me that. Um, and, you know, and I'm never going to let him what? fucking live that down, frankly. Um, and, you know, and then he's going to be like, you know, Emacs, Vim, you know. And, like, what else is he going to say, honestly? Like, there are people who have sort of outlived, like, do we really need the same person to come in and talk about everybody? There are, there, there are some amazing, under-recognized people coming up through the ranks who we should be giving more time to. And Stallman... Right. Fuck yeah! So, Thank you. You're my audience. Thank you. Um, you know, like I shouldn't be up here. I've been up here every single fucking hope since 2006. Why am I here? You know, like, no. I mean, I'm serious about this. Like, the same people keep showing up this conference, and there's a lot of younger people doing fantastic organizing. There's people further away from hacking who we should be getting in here. We should bring them. That, that's that's good. That kind of gets to my point of of yeah. you know, even looking at this, we uh, maybe it's not really homogenizing that. Well, I was gonna say, hmm. it's skewed in that direction where where we see a lot of people who are you know rally for the cause and all yeah. that. And how do we change that? I mean, this this I see. Thank you. One of the things that that I've noticed is I've seen a lot more. Um, a lot less of look what I did talks and a mm. lot more of oh my god we have to do something that's and, a really good point yeah and, absolutely you know but a lot of people would also say and I've heard this counterpoint too that hope has always had a political yes uh, I don't know maybe a political flavor to it yeah absolutely uh, but on the other hand uh, you know flipping back in the other direction mm -hmm. um, I personally don't believe uh, you know in hacking uh, I, I think hacking has a pure form mm -hmm. and I believe that by politicizing it or or by going rally for the cause and, and a lot of these things that we might see at hope this season um, kind of might actually detract from you know look you you can apply your it doesn't have to be the that's Trump own, people you hack that's its own discussion yeah, yeah I mean like you know the the neutrality of technology so, I think so is how do we change this yeah. you know um, no that's a really that's a, a fantastic question yeah um, I mean the the actually one of the best ways to be honest um, it's it's actually quite easy to change the content of who shows up at hope um, and I do recommend you all do this um, there is some fantastic legwork. Um, as much as he drives me crazy sometimes, Bernie S. tends to like be the guy who goes out and like gets every single person in. And he's actually done a pretty good job of bringing in diversity, despite the fact that he fucking called me hysterical a couple hopes ago. My womb is not wandering around my body, pressing on organs and make me crazy, okay? <laughs> Fuck you, right? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Don't use that word, not with me. Um, so yeah, but like he, he does, seriously, he goes out and he finds people. So the, the way to go and change the face of hope is to recommend more speakers. And they will take more recommendations. They encourage your friends to send more stuff in. 
um, that's really one of the easiest things to do because all you have to do is be like, hey, you go do a thing, you know? Um, and then sometimes you might have to be like, hey, I have to pay for your airfare now. Like that can actually be kind of challenging because we don't, you know, like we're a, still a very bo uh, shoestring kind of a conference, but yeah. I see a mouse, I think. Hi, that mouse. Hi, mouse. How are you doing? Thank you for this extraordinary conversation. Thank you, my it's dear. It's well worth having. Um, two points, if I may. Mm -hmm. The first is, is how to get more be beginners involved. At Besides Las Vegas, we've got a proving ground. And the proving ground, it takes people who have never given a presentation before but have an idea that they'd like to talk Ooh. about, matches them with a mentor, they work on the slides, they work on, on the talk, and then they have a chance to present at Las Vegas. So, uh, so maybe cool. we can do something like that with hope as well. Yes, that would be fantastic. Um, the second point I wanted was to, to address um, the first um, questioner about the idea of putting people on a pedestal. Um, there's ne actual neuroscience that shows that when you do that, their brain changes and they begin to, to listen less and to have far more confidence without questioning themselves. Mm -hmm. Um, in addition to what it does to the rest of us, like learned helplessness is a thing. If you begin to sort of go, go up to somebody and be like, no, you don't know, you don't know, yeah. uh, maybe you know, okay, and, you and don't know, you, maybe you know, and then like that, that confusion makes them be like, okay, I'm just, uh, no, uh, you do your thing, okay, yeah, and, continue. And the second problem with putting someone on a pedestal <clears throat> is they stop contributing. They begin living on the glory of the things that they've yeah. done, but, Absolutely. but there's no new ideas coming out of them. And yep. People always have ideas. You, sh you never want your brain to get into that position. So don't put people in a position where that's going to happen. Fantastic points. If, if you're going to come up and, and ask a question with no question mark at the end and do two of them, do it like Mouse did. That was fucking great contribution right there. <laughs> cool. You guys, this is a great conversation. Let's keep going. Go ahead. Uh, hi. Hi. So, um, is that Emmanuel? That is. Hi, Emmanuel. Other hi. Emmanuel. Hi. Not, not, yeah, they're different Emmanuel. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, I had a brief question. If yes. you are in a position where you may be on the opposite side, you may be approaching rock stardom and Ooh. you're trying to avoid that, mm. and you want to, like, what is the best way to sort of say, I'm no, like, let's change that from the side of, like, being a person who has, who is gaining power, who has yeah, the yeah. cards? Yeah, that's a good point. Um, and that happens to a lot of us. Um, like I would say, that happened to me. I mean, I don't know that I have power, but um, yeah, what? F fail more and fail publicly. That's a very interesting one. Um, also, mentor people, like Mouse, uh, to some extent, like has been brought along by a million years ago. Mouse is now here very much on her own recognizance, but Matt Blaze brought her along a trillion years ago. Uh, at Hope. Yeah, so, so bring, bring young people along. Um, don't groom them, don't abuse them, but like, you know, bring them along. Um, and do like it, it frequently is a, th a matter of deflecting. Um, you know, like yesterday, people kept coming to me and be like, "Oh, great concert you had last night." I did almost nothing, and like admit what you've done, admit what you have and have not done. I did almost nothing yesterday. That was largely Justin Gerardo and the organizing, Tamara Yadao, who wasn't even there on the organizing. Um, so really do, and then you know, like when it comes to the press, point to you know, so, to, like if the press comes to you and is like, "Hey, you're so sexy," be like, "These other people are also fantastic, and let's not talk about the sexiness." Actually, so um, trying to reframe things when it comes to um, you know, when it comes to somebody trying to set the dialogue, and it's hard with the press. Like every now and again, they'll just they'll just try to do it, you know, because people do want to get on, in on the sexiness and. Um, we've, we just have to work on reframing. So actually, um, one of the great things that activists frequently do is go learn how to give sound bites. Um, like, learn how that works so that you don't, like, you know, you say 50 great things about the actual technology and then something that they take is sexy and then they use the sexy quote, you know? So um, get educated on how to do that stuff too. So thanks. Next person. Hey, uh, thanks for the great talk. It's a very important subject matter. So I, I'm really glad that you uh, brought these different things up. Um, I, I do also, I commenting on an earlier um, uh, comment that was made, uh, I do kind of notice that Hope it does have a little bit of a uh, political uh, bent to it mm -hmm. as a conference. Yep. And I, I kind of, for the most part, I, I kind of find myself comporting with that as a worldview, just as a generic sentiment, mm -hmm. not completely, because uh, you know it is kind of a herd of cats. Sure. Um, but, uh, but nonetheless, I kind of notice in, in this conference in particular, there's, there's more of a theme than usual, um, I think, and it's kind of anti-Trump, uh, more or less. Uh, mm -hmm. It's kind of, kind of the theme I kind of notice. Uh, Do I need to ask what your hat says? It says, make America great again, absolutely, yeah. So, oh. so I, I, I said with irony or with, with, uh, with directness? Oh, no, with, I'm a nationalist, yeah. Oh, a nationalist, okay. Yes, yeah, oh. but, but I, I believe in free movement of people with mm. kind of with 
with things attached in a little bit. So anyway, but that's that's an aside. Um, so I, I kind of just wonder. I, I did I did hear what you said. I, I like what uh, what you have to say about differences in people and kind of respecting that. Mm -hmm. um, I also note that uh, uh, John John Draper is not in attendance at this yep. conference. Yeah, there was a public statement saying he's not welcome. Right. Yeah. I, I, that's I, Captain Crunch for everybody who doesn't know. Captain Crunch. Yeah, yep. That's right. Yeah. The mm -hmm. one of the guy who kind of popularized the what became known as twenty six hundred, the frequency. If people might not yep. want to look into that. It's yep. kind kind of a seminal figure. Anyway. Um. So I I kind of. He's a, he also was a neurodiverse individual, and uh, there, yep. there's a lot of ex eccentricity in our community. Mm -hmm. um, yes. And some things that people might do can be um, interpreted different and differently than uh, maybe mm -hmm. would be conventionally um, accepted. So I'm just curious if you if you think that um, that it's appropriate to kind of exclude uh, on the basis of, um, I mean, I understand he does have a celebrity, f there's a celebrity factor, but if you think it's appropriate to um, exclude people that may also have celebrity going for them, but, um, you know, there's a certain dynamic like with the Me Too movement um, where there's a certain like a uh, crowd um, a crowd dynamic that comes back where certain people can come out with claims that may or may not actually have a whole Sorry, basis. Sorry, you get into fact. the question mark. Yeah, yeah, and so I'm just, I'm just wondering if you think that it's, it's kind of appropriate to, um, to go with more or less uh, a, a, like a basically a listen and believe point of view um, and kind of work with a rules-based system of exclusion if you don't think that's a little ironic in the context of... We the, have evidence. This. No, we have evidence. I mean, of, special, specifically of, when it comes to crunch. We have people who have been touched by crunch in gross ways that they did not want, right? Like, this is so, what we're, what we're talking about is people's actions. If somebody's, somebody's right to swing their fist um, collides with somebody else's right to not have their face punched, um, the person swinging their fist will be asked to leave, and Captain Crunch has been asked to leave. Sure. Right? If, it's, if it's that blatant, I totally understand. I just, I, I wonder where this evidence is, and I would, I would like to see it, or I think it should be um, You can talk to Matt Blaze. He has come forward as being somebody who is, yeah. And as a matter of fact, and like, I expected to get the, um, hasn't Jacob Applebaum been set up? If you've hung out with Jacob Applebaum for any period of time, it's completely clear that he did the things that he did, because like I said, he's constantly violating people's boundaries in ways that are like, really freaky and sure. that's it's not it, it is a disservice to those of us who are neurotypical to excuse abusers by saying oh it's just because they're neurotypical right people who are non-neurotypical are generally pretty good at being like okay I got I got I'm getting my sense of the rules I know that I need to not bother other people right so like they it's possible for them to learn that so it's not it's not right to excuse people um, for their abuse, yeah. So okay, sure. I, I just want to make a last uh, comment. Nope, I sorry. Do think you it's have the taken up a great deal of their time, and there's somebody standing behind you. Thank you very much for your time. All right. Sure. Thanks. Stock next and trade of the intelligence community of Smears. Um, next person, please. Yes. Thanks. Hi. How you doing? Hi. Um, I'm kind of a newcomer. I came last year, and I do appreciate, welcome. Appreciate um, sort of like the gentleman said that there's a call to action. Mm -hmm. um, so my question is is to, I guess the two things that I would just like want to hear from you about expanding, it seems very much about, uh, sorry, <laughs> I guess the, the areas are people who are not technologists is okay. what I say. Sure. Um, that, that's definitely me and mm -hmm. like how we're working in groups mm -hmm. and, but wanting to work with, but not solely. And so I guess- Sorry, wanting to work with who? To have the, you, to have this discussion about what hope is all about, which mm. is like the yes. technology in our lives, essentially, and how we're interacting with mm -hmm. it. But so how we can engage with that really mm -hmm. uh, in a diverse way. And also, I think the other point that often doesn't get mentioned, we talked about, you know, abuse, but we don't really talk about the sort of um, uh, other ways that we're challenged in terms of oppressed communities and again like the intention that we're trying to bring in to that so okay. that's i guess so so i think um, let me make sure that i'm understanding your questions your first question was how do non-technologists engage in the community and yeah i mean I, I guess like like i would just like to have a space where how do they are they wa willing to engage or is it just like tech people talking to tech people okay a lot i guess like that's what it seems like sometimes so, there's when you talk yeah. about punching up or punching down mm -hmm. it's difficult sometimes for me to not want to punch up and, and i feel sometimes like i'm punching up at people who are tech technologists yes. <laughs> that was a point that was brought up to me while i was writing this talk was um 
there are these moments where we still believe that as hackers we are completely marginalized and we have no power. That's increasingly not the case. Like, I mean, you know, it was maybe the case back before like 1995 when the first graphic internet browser hit. Um, things have really changed. Like, power is very much in the hands of technologists in a lot of ways. It's not the only power. There are other powers out there. But um, it's, yeah, so sometimes you might get punched up at. Um, and then I think all of us has to sort of do a reckoning individually about like, what do I do then? Uh, you know, who am I? What is my role? Um, you know, and really sort of think about what the other person is saying. Um, I, I'm, so, I'm sort of still trying to have yeah, a the other hard point time getting just a about that. that the, like you said, the <clears throat> secrecy and power. I think yes. sometimes, like you said, like we're not making a lot of effort into mm -hmm. making the language really accessible to yes. the people who most need it, yes. and so that we are collaborating really effectively. Sure. With it's, it's still a, like way high barrier. Yeah. No. And there's a lot of really good efforts about that. I'm actually headed next week to work with a group of people who are working on um, security usability. If you follow the flag of security usability wherever it goes or um, privacy See, That's a word right there. I'm sorry yeah. to interrupt you. Uh, that's what I'm trying to say. It's ah. like just exactly this is the point. Like the peep technology is not the minutia of the people, like this little small group that have like gone to a computer science class mm -hmm. and more. And this is, yep. you yep. know, it really needs to get out of okay. it. So sorry, were you objecting to the term usability as a, it's No, it's just no? like a phrase that you said, that you threw out there that like was expected to like know what I was. No, I hear you, I hear you. <laughs> anyway. It took me a while. I actually do work on making computers less sucky to use, which is how I would break down usability. Okay. Um, and I do regularly. Um, and um, I found the term, it took me a while to find the term security usability, right? But like to some extent it does what it says on the tin. You make it usable, right? Um, and so, yeah, so it is, and this is, this is the, the kind of work we all have to do. We have to do the breaking down of like, don't say it quickly, don't do the jargon, um, and, and make, give people space to be like, excuse me, acronym check? Like, what the fuck was that acronym you just used, right? Like, that's a, that's a pretty common one that I use. Um, so yeah, we need, to do, we need to do a lot of work on that. Look for the great communities doing work. Um, I think Access Now is doing some good work. Um, Simply Secure, my former employer. Um, usable, the Usable project is doing some really cool stuff about like making things easier to use. Tactical Tech, Tactical fucking Tech, man. Tactical Tech is a really great organization in Europe um, doing uh, work on helping train people and, and really getting the training for uh, technical tools um, to the place where really non-technical people can use them. Um, my suggestion if you're gonna do security usability training don't roll your own, like, just like crypto, don't roll your own, like, respect the fact that, like, training is hard and you don't actually understand how people's brains work for the most part, like, most of us don't, even I don't have a great grasp of it. Um, so go find the people who have done good training, and for, for that front, I would absolutely recommend tactical text trainings. EFF is also doing some good work, too, on that front. I think, do we have time for another question, or do we have to roll? Nope, AV's cutting me off, I really apologize. Thank you all so much, this was a fantastic discussion. Um, thank you, I really appreciate it. <laughs>